All right, guys. All right, sorry for that pause. We were uh, in the middle of uh, chapter 18, everything you ever need to know about Puerto Maldonado, Peru. So I'm done with that long diatribe uh, from the Peruvian government BS. Back on the streets. <clears throat> As it was a beautiful day in the ugliness of Puerto Maldonado, I decided to forego the mile-long tuk-tuk ride and elected to stroll along past the endless succession of chicken joints, dive bars, copy shops. I never did figure out what the hell all those Puerto Maldonadans were copying to support so many copy shops motorcycle repair shops, internet cafes, laundromats, and store after store after store that sold the exact same merchandise for, I assume, the exact same price. I was particularly impressed with the town's leering, frequently lewd mannequins, many of which had been twisted into suggestive sexual positions and capped with wild, flowing Farrah Fawcett wigs. One or two even had Gene Simmons' kiss-styled black tongues wagging out from between lascivious red lips. I stopped briefly inside a natural foods grocery in addition natural foods grocery in addition to the ropes of hot dogs for sale it seemed the number one most popular natural food in the environmentally correct store were the gallons upon gallons of palm oil number one choice in Brazil the acres of plastic bottles of palm oil proclaimed proudly. Halfway back to my host hotel I stumbled quite by accident upon downtown Puerto Maldonado's major tourist attraction because it is downtown Puerto Maldonado's only tourist attraction. The wildly improbable and tragically ironic Mirador de Biodiversidad, otherwise known as the Biodiversity Overlook. Positioned literally on a concrete island in the middle of a busy city intersection, before me stood the bustling community's single tallest building, a ten-story drab gray and green concrete and broken glass tower that beckoned the eco-tourist to trudge to the top of its winding staircase to view the sprawling town's burgeoning biodiversity. It reminded me quite a bit of my old friend the Canopy Tower back at Manu Wildlife Center, the essential difference being, of course, that there was not a kapok tree or any other tree over 20 feet tall surviving anywhere near this tower. Astonished to find the place open for business, I woke up Sleeping Beauty inside the ticket booth and paid her my 66 cent fare. I asked her if many gringos came through the, came through the mirador. Claro, mucho, she chirped brightly. I paused briefly in the dingy lobby to pay my respects to a poster describing the depressing list of endangered species in the Peruvian Amazon, then headed up the stairs. On every landing hung a photo of some Catholic priest who had died in a plane wreck in 1941. The tower seemed to be some sort of temple dedicated to this enigmatic figure. Emerging into the bright flood of sunshine, I walked around the roof of Puerto Maldonado <clears throat> to survey the highlights of the gateway to the Peruvian Amazon's biodiversity in the year 2009. Here are just a few of those highlights. <clears throat> Seven cell phone towers, three logging trucks, two jet planes, 
one lumber barge, one half-constructed highway bridge, 7,000 tuk-tuks, 12,000 motorcycles, 750 miles of power lines, and one squirming mass of maggot-like humanity jamming the city's littered concrete sidewalks far off into the most distant eastern horizon, halfway to Bolivia, I could barely make out the dim, hazy outline of a single kapok tree. Unless, of course, it was just another 10-story concrete mirador de biodiversidad looking back at me. <clears throat> I made it back to the Royal Roach Trap minutes ahead of checkout time, unable to face another night of honking horns and revving engines on the busy street corner. I packed up my bag of cannonballs and made hasta luego to the jabbering parrots and flirtatious front desk clerk. I flagged down a daisy yellow tuk-tuk and told the driver to take me to the cheapest and quietest hotel in Puerto Maldonado. He knew just the place I was looking for. The Hotel Moderno. The Hotel Moderno, I said, sounds a little fancy. Is it expensive? No, amigo. It's muy barato. It's very cheap, he assured me. We chitty-chitty banged-banged our way down the busy avenue, past the mango-fringed central plaza, and dead-ended into the mercury-tainted banks of the Mother of God. Directly in front of us was the construction site of the Highway to Hell's $30 million bridge, $1 for every man, woman, and child in Peru, and from and from Brazil some 100 miles to the northeast. Three giant concrete bridge abutments loomed out of the muddy maw of the Mother of God like oversized shark fins, portending the bloody feeding frenzy to come when the bridge is finished. I was happy to see the construction crew was taking the day and hopefully the year off. A half block upstream from the bridge on the other side of the quiet street sat, or to be more accurate, sagged, the sad-looking little Hotel Moder Moderno. Moderno, my ass, this dilapidated termite mound had left Moderno behind during last century's rubber boom. Is this the Hotel Moderno or the Hotel Primitivo? I asked the driver sarcastically. It's the Hotel Cheap and Quiet, he retorted, rankled by my whiny gringo attitude. <clears throat> the kindly but ancient hotel proprietor led me down the gloomy hallway to my $5 prison cell like he was the warden in a Merle Haggard song leading a death row inmate to his doom. From his pocket he retrieved a screwdriver, which served as the key to my room and, I assume, as the key to the other 15 rooms. As he fiddled with the lock, I questioned him about the security of such a system. He responded in irrefutable logic that no thief would waste his time robbing the Hotel Moderno as nobody who would agree to spend the night in such a dump would own anything worth stealing. He pushed open the door and ushered me inside my modern little cell, complete with modern lumpy little bed, modern naked light bulb swinging from a cord, and modern asthmatic fan held together by modern duct tape. My most pressing order of business sent me trotting down the hall to the modern community, community bathroom. I will spare you the gory details where I was dismayed but not surprised to discover there was no seat on the modern toilet. 
not only was there no toilet seat, but there was naturally no toilet paper either. With a mounting sense of urgency, I tracked down the maid who was enjoying an afternoon cerveza with a couple of her friends and delicately asked her for some toilet paper. No hay papel aquí. There is no toilet paper here, she said, shrugging and rolling her eyes at her friends. Praise Gaia! I remembered the roll of TP I had packed in my bag of cannonballs for the bus ride from Hill all those weeks before. Do not ever step on a bus in Peru with your out, without your own TP, so disaster was narrowly averted. That brush with death behind me, my final item of business before dinner was to take a modern cold shower. I returned to my cell for a towel to find, obviously, no towel. I went back to the maid to ask for a towel. No hay toalla aquí, she said, shrugging and rolling her eyes at her friends. As I walked away dejectedly, I heard a peal of twittering giggles behind my back. Twenty minutes later, I emerged drip-drying from the Hotel Moderno and headed for the plaza in the gathering twilight to track down dinner. Supper, pizza, salad, and ice cream was no problem, but for the life of me, I could not find a beer anywhere in the dozen eateries around the square. Apparently, in a brilliant move to keep drunks from passing out in the plaza, Puerto Maldonado City Fathers had moved all the bars at least four blocks from the family-friendly square. This was, in fact, the only attempt at urban planning and zoning I ever witnessed in the entire Peruvian state of Madre de Dios. Thirsting for a cold cerveza to cap off my long, hot day, I headed down the sidewalk above the Tambopata River, a side stream of the Madre de Dios, and I arrived at a pleasant little cantina nestled into a grove of banana trees. I ordered up a 55-gallon drum of cerveza and settled myself at a small table to unwind. The table looked out over the mile-long, four-lane straightaway of Puerto Maldonado's busiest boulevard, which doubled as the stretch of the highway to hell leading to Cusco. Some 20 yards directly in front of my table, the wide avenue made a 90-degree sweep to the driver's left, then continued a total of six more blocks before ending abruptly at the banks of the bridgeless Mother of God, at least until the bridge is finished, at which time the road will end at the Atlantic Ocean. In other words, the road went virtually nowhere beyond where I was sitting. Then where, I wondered, were the dozens, no hundreds, if not thousands of motorcycles in front of me going, wave after wave after wave of motorbikes, three abreast, everyone piloted by a male with a female passenger clinging to him like a baby koala bear, poured out of the city center heading my way. As they approached the tight curve, I could hear the click of the foot pedals gearing down, then the white glow of the oncoming headlights would be replaced by the rosy twin glow of receding taillights. As the alcohol began to flow through my tired brain, this never-ending parade of motorcycles morphed into a lovely ballet of floating lights that had the precision of an Olympic figure skating team, I soon became mesmerized by the hypnotic light show and grew drowsier and drowsier as the 55 gallons sank lower and lower until it was gone. But 
by the time I had caught up on some emails and made it back to the Hotel Moderno, it was past 9 p.m. before I crashed onto the lumpy bed in the tiny but blissfully dark and quiet prison cell. I had just drifted off into La La Land when suddenly, as if from a bad dream, I was jolted awake by a flood of bright light from the next cubicle's bare bulb. The thin wall separating the rooms did not reach to the ceiling, allowing one room's light and noise to travel unobstructed into all the neighbor's cubicles. It was two young, male, very drunk gringo tourists arriving back home from their night on the town. One of them was excitedly and loudly like drunks or so famous for describing to his buddy the San Pedro cactus, otherwise known as peyote or mescaline trip he had recently taken in Cusco where they sell the potent hallucinogenic brew in the public market for the price of a couple of beers. And I swear to you, dude, I ain't, li I ain't lying, the loudmouth tourist lied. Three hours into the trip, I got this fucking woody that could have cut glass. I mean, I was so fucking horny, I could have fucked the spots off an anaconda. Excuse me, dude, I hollered over the open partition at the partition at the clueless fucking moron. As much as I and everyone else in this hotel want to hear about your spiritual experience on San Pedro, some of us are trying to get some sleep around here. Could you please take that shit outside? No problema, dude, the guy called back. Jesus, man, chill out. And that is exactly what I did. Okay, and that brings us to the end of chapter 18. And in chapter 19, we will head through the gates of hell.